And I think we are live. Let's uh, go ahead and get started. Do you want to take it away, Kathleen? Hi, you guys. Um, I am like super excited to introduce my, my good friend, Stephen Rowley, who um, wrote one of my very favorite books of last year called The Editor. And um, God, you know, Stephen, I just fell in love with this book the minute I read it. Um, I, I was really lucky. I got it about, I would say about six to eight months before it came out. I think I read it in August of 2018. Um, yeah, sounds right. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired the book? Sure. Uh, you actually discovered the editor, I think, before you read my first book. I did. The Octopus. I that, did. Yeah. And, and um, then I went although, back and read that. Yeah. And they're, they're very different different books, um, but it's hard to talk about the editor without without backtracking for a moment to talk about Lily, which is um, a book that I wrote in 2016, uh, which came out, and it was a very autobiographical uh, story about a man and his friendship with his aging dog. And um, that one was, you know, I denied it at the time, but, it, but you know, <laughs> I've made peace with the fact that it is, you know, hard to deny that that main character is, is me and um, I when I wrote it I never intended for I never thought it would be published it's a strange little book about a, a man a dog and an octopus and uh, so who would have thought that would have ever taken off uh, so when I was writing it I was just writing for myself um, and I made the story as weird as I thought it needed to be uh, and I was sort of sort of writing to entertain myself uh, Somewhere along the line, though, uh, Simon & Schuster got wind of this, this book, and it became a national bestseller, and then it was translated in 19 languages, and uh, Hollywood came calling, and there's a film in development, and, and suddenly, everything that I had sort of revealed about myself, thinking it would never be seen or read by anyone, was suddenly out there for anyone who wanted to plunk down, you know, twenty twenty four ninety five 95 or however much the cover price was. Uh, so suddenly all these things about me and uh, the people that I wrote about um, were, were very much available uh, for consumption. Uh, and so when it came time to uh, think of a follow-up, I, you know, that was very fresh on my mind. And so while I had escaped the experience and it was, it was on the whole very positive um, and I was very lucky, I wanted to think about a story about another young writer, I say young, a young writer, uh, who uh, was armed with a candidly autobiographical novel, and what events might happen that would uh, get that sort of snowballing beyond his control and make it a much bigger story uh, than he intended. Um, and that's when I sort of thought, uh, while well, the events that happened to me personally were not interesting enough to sustain a novel, um, what if, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis was his editor. What if the book was about his mother and he was suddenly caught between these two very maternal figures, one his own flawed mother and then the sort of perfect image of, of America's mother. Um, and, uh, and if Jackie were his editor, wouldn't the book suddenly become much bigger deal than he had originally intended? Um, and from there it kind of took off. So it started with just like a little idea of, of, of making something bigger and I mean there were so many things I loved about this book I mean one of the things I really loved was the dynamics between James and his mom because his mom is an incredibly flawed character she just is yeah she's a she's a mess um she's lived a lie basically her entire life um you know she's put out the aura of, you know in to the public eye of being the perfect wife and mother but yet we all know what James There's is a, a product of. Yeah. And then kind of the reason, the way she reveals it is just like, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so a lot of people want to know if that's my mother. Uh, it is not. Uh, uh, I did write some things about my mother in Lily and the Octopus, which she wasn't a fan of at the time. I thought it was very beautiful, the way I wrote about my mother in Lily. Um, I said a few things that were honest, uh, but I thought it was really lovely. And most readers, I think, really spark to that um, relationship, well, I know the I did. relationship in Lily and the Art. Yeah. Um, and so 
the mother and the editor is not my mother, uh, and this story is not my story, but it's just inspired by having previously written very autobiographical uh, fiction. But you know, I loved the mother uh, character and the editor as well, flawed as uh, oh, I loved her she too. may be. I think you know, there's a line, I think it's in Lily actually, but I think you know, as kids, we're guilty of thinking that our parents were sort of born as fully functional adults the same day that we were born, you know, that they don't have childhoods of their own, that they don't have wounds, that they don't have um, r wrongdoings uh, that were sort of uh, committed against them. Um, and so understanding our parents as people, as fellow humans, I think is, is a big part of growing up. Well, and another thing is, why did you choose to set it in the 90s? Because I know it's set in the uh, well, early once I 90s. Well, decided to go with, with yeah, with Jackie, uh, you know, she passed away in 1994. So if I were going to use her, um, and she did have uh, a 15 year career in book publishing after uh, her second husband, Onassis, died. Um, and she did have this very prolific career, this, this really uh, incredible third act to her life um, that not a lot of people anymore remember or, or know about, or, or only know it sort of in passing and not realize that she had edited almost a hundred titles, um, fiction, nonfiction, coffee table books, really all sorts of different topics that, um, that, that sort of spread the, the sort of width of interest that you think she might, you know, someone like Jackie would have. It was really an extraordinary career. Um, but if I were gonna use her, then, it, then I was sort of locked into a time frame somewhere between the late 70s and the early 90s. And what I loved about the early 90s in terms of book publishing was it was an industry in transition, you know? I remember it. Um, and for writing also. Um, the internet wasn't quite here yet, but it was looming. It was looming large and publishers didn't know what that meant for publishing, for the printed book. Um, were, were books even gonna be a thing anymore? That was sort of the fear for a while then. So it was an interesting time to, um, uh, and by the way, I happy to report that the printed book is alive and well. Thank goodness for uh, those who love bookstores and, and reading still uh, hard copies. I have an e-reader. I do love it for travel, but there's nothing like a, there's nothing like a printed book for me. Uh, so just that sort of time in flux. Um, and I love like pre-cell phones, pre-email, pre-being available to everybody. Um, in a pre-digital world, it forced the sort of characters to confront um, themselves and their flaws uh, sort of in person, which I thought was much more interesting. Well, and also I hadn't thought of this till you just made the point. It also creates these natural, intimate moments in spaces that maybe if right. it had been set now, obviously with Jacqueline and Onassis, it couldn't have been, but then those meetings would have happened in other formats. And so it's more natural at that time for him to go to restaurants and to homes and, and to you know, be with his editor in this very intimate way. So that's a, a really nice deal. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can say from the, the book selling point of view, I started off as an events coordinator in 1991. So I was at the very, kind of the mm -hmm. beginning of this halcyon age that we had of, of publishing. Right. And we would fly to New York two to three times a year to book our events. That's how we did it. And we would meet with wow. publicity and editors. And yeah, I mean, you know, I know a lot of editors and I know them from that time because a, a lot of the editors, they stay forever. And um, yeah. And I, as I was saying, this, one of my best friends, we were talking on Sunday and we were figuring that we've been friends for over 30 years. And we started as him being a associate publicist and me being, you know, an events coordinator, not having a clue with what I was doing. And we've yeah. maintained, he's like, he's now one of my best friends and has been for, you know, 25 years. And, you know, I mean, I was thinking it was such a great time. And that's what I loved about the book is, is also the, kind yeah. of the publishing world that you look at. I remember that. And it was really, it was a totally different time. Yeah. And there were, there were storied editors, you know, editors were as big as celebrities sometimes as their writers. You know, if you think yeah. of not, not only someone like Jackie, but like a Nan Talese or a Michael Corda or Chuck Adams or, you know, these big name Sunny, editors Sunny that yeah. Sunny Meta, the late Sunny Meta, yeah. Um, 
you know, so we're sort of sort of mythic figures in their own right. Um, and that that sort of throwback to, you know, sort of the suede elbow patch in publishing uh, <laughs> is, uh, you know, was a lot of fun to write about. Um, I'm blessed with a really fantastic editor now, and she pushed me really hard in working on this book, um, particularly why Jackie? Why not another high-powered editor? Why not a fictional former first lady who, who went on to have a career in publishing? Um, why, why specifically Jackie? And she pushed me on, on answering that, and hopefully by the, the, by the time the book is over that uh, that question has been answered. But a lot of editors don't have time to, to edit anymore, to have those types of relationships with uh, their authors. They're, you know, the business just moves too quickly. They're, they're more acquisitional than editorial and um well i think uh, that know, you're I'm, really I'm blessed i'm very blessed yeah i i love sally sally kim is yeah. uh steven's editor <laughs> sally and kim. she is um she's like probably one of the most talented editors i every time she touches something i literally almost fall in love with it so her you taste can is impeccable you know if it's if it's one of sally's books you know you're gonna love no, it you're gonna love it yeah yeah so can I ask a question? So um, I, I was so touched by the portrait that you painted of, of Jacqueline Onassis, and it was so mm -hmm. very um, loving and very respectful. And, um, and I think, and you, you touch on this several times in the book of how easy it is to become very voyeuristic with someone as famous as she is, and especially her, right? Like she's such an object but you don't treat her that way. Like she's so human. And so I wondered if you could just talk a little bit, like, have you always had a space in your heart for her? Like, obviously there are many reasons why it makes sense in the novel, but just her choice as one of the main characters and that balancing act of how you actually portray someone who's that famous and yet we know very little about really. Like, I just thought you did that beautifully. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, don't, I haven't had a lifelong fascination with her, um, but I, 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 you know, sort of half joked about this. I think when I did an event, Kathleen at the at the store was, uh, you know, I remember very vividly seeing uh, an episode of Project Runway of all things, uh, in the sort of maybe about 10, 12 years ago, and they did a Jackie O challenge, and they showed these these pictures of her, different portraits of her life, you know, in a Chanel suit, um, in the in the like a gauzy thing she might have worn on the yacht in Greece. Um, and then there was just a simple picture of a woman in, in blue jeans and uh, maybe a suede jacket walking down the street in New York reading a book. And it was just this simple photo that had been captured by the paparazzi. And, I, I, and I, all of a sudden I was fascinated by who, who is that woman? That's someone I want to know. Um, and that's sort of what kicked off uh, my um, fascination with her, her time in publishing. Um, there's some great nonfiction books too, if anybody reads the editor and wants to learn more, one of them is called Reading Jackie uh, by Bill Kuhn, uh, who's been a big supporter of this book. Um, and that's, that's a really wonderful biography of her time, specifically in, in uh, publishing, if anybody wants to know more. But it started with reading, you know, reading uh, biographies about her. Um, it, I had a very supportive uh, publisher and Sally was very helpful in helping me track down people uh, not only writers who had worked uh, with her, but other colleagues that had worked uh, with her in the office, um, who shared some some great stories. Um, someone in particular even said, you know, the reason I had such a successful working relationship with Jackie is because I never spoke about her mm -hmm. outside of the office, and I'm gonna continue to honor that to this day. And that was, uh, last year was 25 years since her death. So that, but that's very telling in itself. Um, I went so far as to read uh, the other books that she had edited the year that this story takes place, just to try to forensically recreate what was on her desk, what topics were interesting to her that year, what, what ideas might have been in the forefront of her mind. Um, and then there's a little bit of the, you know, there's a little bit of the X factor. You can do all the research in the world, but there is a, there is a part of this portrait that is my invention of her, my interpretation um, of her, but I really worked hard to try to get it as authentic um, as it could possibly be. Mm -hmm. 
Nice. Well, you know what they, they say that, that, that even her children have said that the happiest time of her life was when she was in New York City and when she was editing, because that was really who she was. She never strove to be a public figure. She was always an incredibly no, prized no, and, and first lady. Ironically, she had, yeah, she had sublimated so much of her life to these two marriages. Um, and then, you know, by the time that she had this sort of extraordinary third act, it was really a woman stepping into her own. And if we think even, even when she passed, you know, John Jr. came out uh, to the press and said, you know, my mother was surrounded by her family uh, and her books. Um, and that's something, you know, it, it, at, the, at the time of her passing that that was important to say, that, they, that, that these, were the, uh, the, the, these were the things that meant the most to her family and books. Well, I mean, I, I think that that comes across when you see that she gave, in the last couple of years of her life, she gave almost, she gave no interviews. She just went no, about no, being... But she, yeah, it was, you know, about, it was always about the author. She, she gave one interview in her entire career, and even that, didn't, she didn't say much about her work habits or anything. It was, it was about her, the books that she was working on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know she was very well respected in the publishing world. You know, she yeah, wasn't treated she like a celebrity. No, no, she wasn't, but she earned that. I think a lot of people were very skeptical uh, when she was hired, thinking that she was hired only for her Rolodex, that maybe mm. she had access to people who they wanted to get under contract to write books who would have interesting stories. Uh, but she really proved herself by doing the hard work of actual line editing. Um, and she proved very useful, too. There were times when... She was drafted into duty, for instance, uh, when she was at Doubleday, uh, Michael uh, Jackson was contracted to do a book and took their money, but had stalled and stalled and stalled and failed to deliver. And eventually they were like, we either need a book or we're going to cancel this contract. They really wanted the book. So they put Jackie on a plane uh, out to see him and wrangle this book out of him because who could talk, who could, you know, was maybe a bigger celebrity than Michael Jackson that he might listen to. And that was Jackie. So, so you had mentioned um, a little bit about your relationship with your editor and the sort of mm -hmm. the ways in which she challenges you and pushes you, and that obviously resonates with with the character with James and yeah. how he's you know it's it's a difficult journey. You know, this is not an easy. And he thinks he has a book, right? When he starts, he's like, yeah. I'm handing them yeah. a book, and then it's like, oh, he's got, yeah. He, we have yeah. only just begun, you know, and so, um, yeah. and so that element feels like perhaps it is a little bit drawn from, while it's not an autobiographical novel, it is drawn from your own experience um, to a degree and just the, that oftentimes really painful and not knowing where to go and, you know, how am I going to resolve this? Um, did you have moments like that with this novel or how did that process go for you? Uh, oh, for sure, for sure. And in fact, I always tell if there are aspiring uh, writers or, or other writers out there with the manuscript who are, you know, seeking publication, um, I always say work with a freelance uh, editor too, if you can. Just get, you know, amazing things come from collaboration sometimes. Writing, particularly novel writing, can be a very solitary occupation. Uh, and sometimes it's too solitary. And so, you know, there's help that comes uh, in the form of working, working with an editor. Um, with, uh, with Sally, for sure, she pushes me more, you know, every time I think it's done, I think she thinks there's just one more draft uh, <laughs> that, uh, that the book needs. And, you know, as much as I'm like, Ugh. in the moment, I am so grateful for it. So grateful for it, uh, because the end product is uh, so much better for it. Yeah. I was wondering, um, with with uh, Byron being a, a writer, also your partner, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you guys edit each other, or do you kind of leave that part of the relationship alone? I will I say we even... read each other. Uh, I don't know that editing each other was good for any uh, <laughs> partnership or marriage. Uh, <laughs> so I try not to, uh, or, you know... Uh, the the notes that we do give each other are are wrapped in an encouraging hug. <laughs> so uh, I yeah I don't lay any we don't lay criticism 
kind of bear. You know, I think we'll, we'll be honest, but it's more uh, our roles are more to encourage each other than and and to leave uh, leave perhaps the hardest work to to another someone yeah. outside the relationship. <laughs> very wise. That's very wise. Yeah. So uh, how? But how he's my you... first reader for everything. So. Well, as he should be. <laughs> <laughs> And um, how was it to get into James's head? Because there's there's parts of James that that he's a little screwed up. Yeah. Well, um, so you, you you know it's it's written in the the first person. So you Which are um, you do have access to every single thought that he has. So that you know it's hard to it's hard when you're writing in the first person to write a character that uh, doesn't seem a little messed up because you're not you're getting everything. You're getting every unfiltered thought. Um, but for me, it was very interesting um, to write a gay man who was um, in, so in the book, he's about 15 years younger than I am now, but he's also 10 years older than me to make the timeline line. So he, was, he would have been born 10 years before I was to make him that age in the early 1990s to work with Jack. So, it was always interesting to sh have to shift the sort of pop cultural references um, to think about what it meant to be gay in the in the early 1990s. I was just coming out, but what did relationships mean at that time? Uh, what did living in the time of AIDS um, feel like? Uh, you know, more people were dying in the early 1990s than in the in the mid to late 80s even. So, um, and and marriage was not something that was even thought that would be seen in the in that lifetime so uh it was very interesting to sort of go back and think uh about what people a few years older than i am or or who who sort of came of came of age as a gay man a few years ahead of me um had endured had experienced and um what work they had done to make it easier for the rest of us it was really interesting mm -hmm. so do you want to talk oh. talk I fell in love with it because um, I don't know anybody who's been watching any of our Facebook live. My my cat usually interrupts at least once or twice during <laughs> all presentation. And yeah. you know, I mean, I can say that especially during this time, I appreciate her company more than I think I think I ever had before. Uh -huh. um, so, can you tell us a little bit about Lily? Because I know now you have another woman in your life. Yeah, I do. So, uh, well, first I want to say it's very interesting to me now because it seems like everyone's living the writer lifestyle now. If you want to know what it's like to be a writer, you know, you're home all the time. You have no one to talk to. Um, you start talking to the pets. Uh, uh, you don't, no one's know. holding you accountable to shower. You you uh, wonder what is it? Should it be the fourth cup of coffee or the first <laughs> glass of wine? You know, and, and what, how do you balance that? So it's it's just it's funny to me now that to see everybody sort of grappling with the, wow. the lifestyle that writers sort of know all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I do. I have a dog now named Tilda. She's she's getting up there in, in years, so she sleeps a lot. But I highly recommend uh, either a pet, particularly a dog, for a writer because. Um, it's also, I mentioned it was a solitary uh, occupation. It's also a very sedentary occupation. And if there's someone who needs you to get up out of the chair, oh you God. know, several times a day and go for a walk, like that is good for creativity. You need that, you need that blood flow and, and having someone to hold you accountable, at least for that, at least for moving your body once in a while is yeah. great. Oh. Um, but yeah, uh, Lily was a dog that I had. Uh, so Lily from, from the from Lily and the Octopus was an actual dog that I had. The book is a novel, but the dog at its heart was very real. Uh, she passed away in 2013 from from a brain tumor. Um, but when it came time to write about that loss and on our time together, I realized very early on what I was actually writing about was attachment uh, and how difficult it can be to let go. And somehow in my brain it made sense to, to take that leap to an uh, to an octopus that some that having a metaphor that was tentacular um that uh you know with suction cups or the ability to sort of rip right onto you um made sense to me now i'll be the first to admit that that's that's a little bit of a weird leap for some uh, <laughs> but I went with it. 
And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I don't know, I embraced the metaphor and we were off to the, off to the races. But that was a very rewarding uh, book um, for me, uh, you, you know, especially as a, as a debut to have something so personal. But it's also something I try to tell writers also, if there are writers listening now, is like, you know, people are like, you know, I'll get questions a lot of times, you know, what should I, you know, what should I write or what's popular right now? And I always try to tell people not to chase trends. Like, yes, I we tell have, people the same thing. Uh, gone girl and girl on the train and then girl and the woman in the window. And you can try to game the bestseller list, you know, by reverse engineering what's already popular, but publishing moves slowly. And, uh, by the time you write something, you would have to be very lucky to have it come out and not to have personal tastes, you know, sort of move on. So write what's in your heart. You know, if I had asked anybody's permission or if they even thought it was a good idea that I write about a book about a dog and an octopus, um, you know, no one would have said that's a good idea. Good. And uh, I don't, you know, it's also not where great art would come from if you, you know, I talk right. about the importance of editors but sometimes editors shouldn't get involved too early. That uh, you have to have an idea that you're passionate about and um, and really and really run with it. And the fact that my debut got to be something that was so authentically me um, means the world to me. Well, I mean, I think that you know, I mean, some of the the James character after having getting to get after you know the the great honor of getting to know you the last year and a half or so. Um, I would say you're a bit like James, but not quite as dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a compliment. Well, the, the, you know, uh, my, I, write about, I write about mothers a lot, and my, my poor, wonderful father always says, well, how, how, come, you know, how come you never write about me? And I was like, you know what, if I'm not writing about you, that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, and I also think, like, you know, you don't want, you know, if a character's too sane and in the middle of the road you know that's not interesting to write about or read about either so well, I, think you have to keep I think your... both yeah I... it helps to keep my disc but i mean like both start, both of those narrators ted for in lily and the octopus and james and the editor start with a kernel of me and then they're sort of and then i i mess them up a little bit well, <laughs> I, mean, I, I love the it's, fact... it's more interesting i like the fact you know towards the end of lily where where um you know, Lily's gone and, and, and Ted gets to find love. And then after mm -hmm. having the honor of meeting Byron a few months ago, I kind of got it. I went, oh, that's totally Byron. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing. Um, you know, I, the book's been out for, for, you know, almost five years now. So if, if hopefully this isn't a spoiler alert, but, the, but there is a Byron character at the very end of Lily and the Octopus. And it's the one name I, other than Lily's that I didn't, change and we had a long conversation about that uh particularly because there was a lord byron poem um which was an ode to his his dog that i wanted to use to help wrap the book up and it, it just worked so beautifully that that the character or that you know that i was actually with the byron so um i kept you know we had we discussed it and i kept that name uh but it, but then it there was a like a book club guide or some supplemental material that Simon and Schuster put out that was like, you know, what do you think of the Byron character? Do you think he and the narrator have any future together? And I was like, oh no, like book clubs across the country are going to be weighing in on my relationship and, and uh, seeing if it's going to going to click or not. But uh, we've been together now seven years, so so far so good. So far, so good. I, I, I wanted to um, just say one of, one of the many things I loved about the book. So really quickly, Kathleen encouraged me to um, pick up the book, which I think I've read it just in a few days. I just gobbled it up. Um, oh, I love so much about it. But um, I was thinking about, I love two parts about the relationship between James and his mother that is how often we end up hurting people that we're trying to protect. And not yeah. all of the damage comes from that, but you get the sense later that there at least part of what he experienced as you know painful withdrawal, there was this reasoning, right? And, and so that yeah. element, I, I would love you to talk more about and also just how messy healing damaged relationships is, right? It's this imperfect art and 
that you do kind of take one step forward, two steps back um, to try to get there. And I just love how you handled that, um, that whole journey. So if you could talk a little bit about that. I'd... Thank you. Um, yeah, I, we're, we're all flawed. And I've had a, a couple of people say, well, how could James forgive his mother after um, the truth comes out? And again, I'm, I'm hoping more people discover this book and as it comes out in paperback, so I'm, I'm not gonna say specifically what it is, but um, it, it does, you know, it, on some level it seems unforgivable. But if you do look at the motivations behind her reason for keeping it secret, um, it's not that there isn't um, merit to her, to her reasons. Um, and also by the time that the secret does come out, I think James is so desperate for someone just to tell him the truth, someone to offer him some truth. You know, Jackie's pushing him, pushing him to, to find, to write something authentic, to write the, the um, honest emotion behind it. And when he gets sort of this truthful thing to hold on to and, and to have his life finally start making some sense, I think he's very grateful for it. He also makes some big mistakes himself over the course of this book. Um, and I think it's easy uh, by the end of the book for him to realize that maybe they're not as different as he thought they might be at the outset. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the relationships like this are lifelong, um, you know, and sometimes beyond, you know, the healing extends beyond the grave sometimes too. Like these, these are lifelong works. Um, but I love mothers and sons. I think, you know, there's so many books about mothers and daughters, um, you know, and fathers and sons, but mothers and sons, I think is a particularly interesting uh, dynamic. Yeah, for sure. I have two boys, so I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. 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 So Stephen, do you want to tell us a little bit about your new project? Sure, so I have a book coming out uh, in spring of next year. Uh, so first will be the paperback for the editor will come out uh, at the end of June of this year. Um, and then I'll have a new novel next spring called The Gunkle. Uh, it's sort of, I've had a lifelong fascination with Auntie Mame uh, in all its forms. And the, the novel, the Rosalind Russell movie, even the, then the Broadway musical, and then the musical movie with the, although it's, it's poor, poor, um, uh, Lucy is a little bit miscast there. Uh, but anyway, but uh, you know, these were projects that were originated by gay men um, in the you know, sort of 1950s and on. And I think, you know, to me, it's very clear that if written today, Mame would have been a gay man. Uh, and just because that story couldn't be told in the 1950s or 60s, um, that she became sort of this outsized, larger than life woman. Um, so it's sort of a re it's sort of an anti mame type story with the with the gay uncle who oh, uh, you know is sort of outcast larger than life character who inherits two two children and and hopefully hilarity and lots of heart ensues. Oh, it sounds great! Sounds great. Yeah, I'm very excited, very excited for it. And I, I have five nieces and nephews. Uh, I do not have children of my own, so this was a way for me to sort of explore. Um, what it what it means to not have children and particularly as an artist to not have access to what is you know inarguably one of life's great emotional journeys um and and not to have that in my arsenal um as an artist uh but it but it was uh, a nice vehicle for me to to explore a lot of a lot of things going on for me mm -hmm. Well, well and oftentimes I, that, that aunt or uncle can be one of the most valuable relationships in a, in ah, a child's life. It's, yeah, I, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I can say that, that I too forgot to have children. So I am, I am the, the, <laughs> the world's, I like to say the world's best aunt. Um, but I mean, the one thing that I got to do that, that my sisters didn't get to do is I got to take my nephews, like, to do fun stuff, you know, like I, I worked yeah. on a radio show for seven years and I got my nephew a, an internship with me. And he always says, he goes, I got to do the coolest things and meet the coolest people because of you. And I said, no, it was really yeah. because of you. But, you know, I mean, those are the oh. things that, 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 you know, I got to, to do without the baggage of, of having to parent. 
And so, I mean, I think that's what I'm looking forward to reading the Gunkle because he's so used to being the guy that's the fun guy. And all of a sudden he's thrust yeah. into this world where he's forced to be the, the, the parent. Mm. So that's 100%. one of the things that I'm really looking forward to reading. You hear me, yeah. Sally Kim? Oh, good. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sally, Sally. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it, it is a, it is sort of a, a great joy to do that. Um, you know, I didn't find success as a writer in, until I was into my 40s. And, and by then, that was my kind of sole focus. Um, I'd waited a long time for the opportunities in my career that I was being presented. And, and um, I embraced that fully. And I, and, uh, you know, I, People said, oh, you, you could still have kids, but you know, I get tired. I get tired. I don't do anything. I get tired. <laughs> I think it's a young person's game, but we'll see. Yeah. Well, you have a hairy child. <laughs> say no more. Although, I, I have to say, since this quarantine began, I haven't heard from anyone saying, <laughs> well, when are you having kids? Or why don't you have kids? I think, I think people understand now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, I can say that, that um, my, one of my, my very close friends just came by today. I'm going to kill him, so I'm just going to stand here and pretend we're talking. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, I can't be a parent right now. I said, okay. Yeah. I go, we'll just stand right out here and we'll talk about masks. Yeah. Yeah. I will say, uh, you know, my... My mother was a, uh, has four, I'm one of four kids. Uh, my mother largely worked out of the home and ran a daycare center where um, we would have, you know, six or eight more kids in during the day. And I, you know, God bless her. I, I don't know how she did that for all those years. Wow. You know, and, and before cell phones, before Facebook, before having any sort of ability to connect with the outside world or a friend, if you just needed a minute to chat or someone to understand, like, you know, we, did, we weren't connected the way we were then. So, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think I, I, I mean, I, I love my friend. I love her kids, but there's no way I would want to be a single mother in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, so I told yeah. her anytime she needs to pretend she has to drop off a mask, she can come on by and we'll stand out front and talk. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, since, since the store, the store has been not open to the public, like, you know, how, like how many kids come in or how many are people, oh, how many of your them. customers are sort of adopted kids and you miss them terribly. Right. Oh, I totally miss. Them. And I mean, you met some of the kids on, on my birthday. Yeah. Call. I mean, yeah. I'm really lucky. I have a whole group of, you know, I always say to people, I forgot to have kids. So now I get a store full of them. Um, full of them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, Stan can attest. I love these kids. I mean, they hang out at the store. They come in. They show me their things. I mean, a couple of years ago during prom season, they, I was, they stopped by the store and showed me their prom dresses. Aww. You know, I mean, I was like going, Aww. okay, there's a reason why you know I get to do this. Is is I get to yeah. be a part of this really awesome community of people, and I can tell you that that. I never appreciated them more than I do right now. I mean, I miss them terribly and I can't wait to be back yeah. among them again. Yeah. And I can't wait for you guys to come and play hopefully this summer, you and Byron, and we'll uh, celebrate. Yeah, we're gonna pa yes, oh, so, so he has the book. I have to do a little plug. He has his debut novel called A Star is Bored. Ah, there it is. Uh, comes out July 28th. Um, so we're very excited. I hope to make it up to the store and celebrate him. Oh yeah, I would love to celebrate Brian, Byron. You have to admit, Byron is a pretty yeah. awesome guy. <laughs> you have to admit. He's a good guy, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well I got, Everybody I got the loves great Byron. pleasure. Yeah. I got the great pleasure of, of having dinner with him before this all started. Um, yeah, and you got to read the book too, right? Yeah, I read the book. I love the book. It was so funny. Good. good. I mean, it was funny, yeah, heartbreaking, funny. And, and I don't know. Once you meet Byron, you understand where the book came from. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's who he is. He's a, he's a person with big heart. And, you know, yeah. and I, I consider you a very lucky guy, Stephen. <laughs> and I think, I do I, think too. Byron, I think Byron's just as lucky. Because I, as, right. as you Wait, know, say that I can't stand. Oh, <laughs> 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 Don't worry, there's a recording, Stephen. I'll cue that part up. Yeah, when it goes, when it's, 
will this be on the archived on the Facebook page? Because I'm going to yeah. queue up right to that. It will be. Yeah, yeah. We'll, 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 we'll give you that little time time clip to get to that that piece. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I have to admit this was so much fun. Wait a second, you know, Lee, Before before we get let Stephen run away here, you Stephen, you had some recommendations that you wanted to pass. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm oh sorry my goodness. About that. Comfort um, books. Um, First of all, uh, I mean, like how, uh, if anything underscores the importance of books, it's, you know, what we're going through right now, you know, we can't leave our houses, but we can, you know, through these amazing stories, we can travel anywhere. And uh, I've been more sort of so grateful for, for books and the opportunity to do what I do, you know, now more than ever. Um, but there were a couple books that have, that have sort of resonated with me uh, during this time, particularly. Um, and one was uh, uh, Susan Orlean uh, had a book called The Library Book, which is out in paperback now, I think, right? Uh, but uh, it just, um, you know, I'm missing bookstores, uh, but reading that book um, really made me realize how much libraries do for the community as well. And the fact that they're largely closed in our, our communities right now, and people don't have access to the, to the internet, homeless uh, people don't have access to the services that they can get through libraries or, um, you know, English uh, classes or uh, understanding how to apply for government assistance and, you know, sort of all these programs that are run through through libraries. Um, and it's just a safe haven for, for people. And it's, I appreciate libraries uh, sort of now more than ever. Um, there was a novel I loved called The Authenticity, Authenticity Project by Claire Pooley. Um, which is about uh, a group of, of sort of disparate, lonely people learning how to connect through being honest about their own lives and sharing bits of themselves. And um, I really sort of resonated in this time about how much, you know, just, reach, just having an opportunity to have a Facebook chat like this means when we're feeling very isolated um, and the importance of how uh, how much we need connection and uh, to be honest with the people around us. And uh, that was just a really great read to me. Mm. Uh, I think I mentioned another and I can't, uh, offhand I can't remember what it was. Let Michael, me, do you remember? Let me look here quickly. Um, while I'm looking for that, uh, we've got a question in the Facebook chat. Uh, Esther asks sure. whether you can tell us about your journey as a writer. Uh, you, she said in particular, she wants to hear about the day job you got to quit. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the dream, right? Um, you know, I took a, a day job in a law firm. Uh, and in, it was, I lived in Los Angeles at the time. It was an entertainment law firm. Um, <clears throat> and I don't have a law degree, uh, uh, although I do have some paralegal training. But I sort of kept myself at this job because I knew there was no room for advancement. You know, I couldn't be promoted to attorney. So I really tried to keep something with a seal, you know, that had a really firm ceiling. This job was um, great for me and that it provided health insurance and a way for me to pay my bills and put food on the table, but it didn't, uh, it didn't fulfill my soul. Uh, and that was important to keep me motivated while, while writing. Um, it was also difficult because it's hard. It's hard when you sit at a desk all day to want to come home and uh, sit back down at a desk and, and write some more. Uh, a very different kind of writing, um, legal versus creative. But it, you know that's so hard to do. When I was able to make the real change for me, when I really started writing Lily, was when I had switched my routine and started getting up very early in the morning and prioritizing writing first because the day has the way of throwing all kinds of things at you that will derail you uh, from you, you know, your writing time. So that's what made the difference for me, prioritizing the writing every day, uh, doing that first before my job. And I got lucky, I got lucky. Um, but the, uh, uh, when I sold Lily, that it, that it allowed the opportunity uh, for me to, to leave that job, but it wasn't, you know, it was that, and then there, there's a movie deal, and, and I'm, I'm very fortunate. Um, the, the most important lesson that I learned from all of this, though, was that when I was working at the law firm, I was embarrassed to say that I was a writer, or I didn't think I'd earned um, 
the uh, status to say that 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 I was a writer. Um, I was well. I work at a law firm, but I, but I also you know I kind of write on the side. And, and no, if you write, you're a writer, and um, there's no shame in it. There are people who have you know writers whose names you know who still hold down some kind of other job, whether it's teaching. Um, or, or, or what any other kind of job to pay the bills, because this is not, a, you know, very, very few people are fortunate enough to make a full-time living writing novels. Um, that's just sadly the, the, way, uh, the, the way of the industry. Um, so there's, there's absolutely no shame in having a day job, um, and you should always consider yourself a writer with great pride and uh, hold your head up. Nice. Nice. Uh, while uh, you were answering too, I looked up the other book you mentioned uh, was "Do You Mind If I Cancel?" Oh yeah, just for a laugh, because <laughs> couldn't we all use a good laugh? But uh, Gary Janetti, who uh, had written for Will and Grace and for Family Guy and for a bunch of TV shows, has a book of personal essays out called "Do You Mind If I Cancel?" Um, and uh, it's very funny. It's a quick read, uh, but it's guaranteed to make you laugh. And I, I'm laughing now just thinking about it because I can't wait to have plans again. To can canceling seems like such a luxury now. You know, none of us have any plans to can cancel. But like canceling plans, you know, that seems like oh, that's so luxurious. You know, we're we're definitely out of this when we're canceling plans. <laughs> You'll just make a whole bunch of can uh, plans just to cancel them when it's just to cancel. Yeah, oh, I yeah, think yeah. so. Someone I definitely think so. My availability. For someone who asked me my availability for, for another Zoom call, and I was like, you may be surprised to hear this, but, but my schedule is wide open, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll just mention that all of the books that Stephen talked about, uh, including Lily and the editor, and all the recommended books are all in the comments. Um, and if you go to the first page of our website and scroll down to the bottom, we also created a custom page with... Uh, the, uh, all of those books. So if you're you're looking for them, want to find out anything more about them, um, the other yeah, thing. Yeah, and Kathleen, mentioned... people people can pre-order Byron's book. They can pre book they can pre-order Byron's book. We will put and that on the page. Yeah, that comes out in July. Great. We'll we'll put a stars board on there as well. We're gonna. I I don't know if Kathleen mentioned it to you, but we have been doing a weekly book club via Zoom. Um, because there's a lot of people with time on their hands to get through a book a week or whatever. And we're kind of picking favorites too. Yeah. So we, we cheat a little bit as to whether you have to get a whole book read in the week, but we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the editor on May 19th. So that's our next, one of our next upcoming books. Oh, fantastic. Looking forward to that. You know, fantastic. Stephen, if you wanna, if you wanna uh, yeah, pop I, into that call. <laughs> yeah, sure. Feel as free I to said, pop in. I'm around. We will, we will get the, around. we will get the Zoom invite to you here. Yeah. Well, you know, but can I, I say I, something about Byron's book? For, yeah, for please. Those of you who don't know out there, um, Byron was Carrie Fisher's personal assistant for a few years, and um, the star that the star that's bored is uh, Kathy Kamen, who is uh, based. Yeah. Who is definitely based on uh, Carrie Fisher, and some parts of it are just laugh out loud and funny and other parts of it break your heart because they actually loved each other, you know, and, and, yeah. and he was watching her self-destruct. And mm -hmm. I mean, I think for anybody, when you love somebody and watching them not be their best selves, you know, it's, it's hard, but you know, Byron does it with, I think the way Byron would do it, anything. Cause I, I've been watching, I watched some of the Tilda Swinton stuff and um, oh yeah, yeah they're <laughs> hilarious. That's another thing, guys. If you if you want to see something really funny, I did share it on my page. There's a um, a, a little thing with the Tilda Swinton cast that is laugh out loud funny. Yeah, he he, it, he wrote a play and started in a play called Tilda Swinton Answers an Ad on Craigslist, <laughs> and that uh, has played around the world. Uh, but uh, the last two summers at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival oh, uh, in Scotland, it's a really, it's a really incredible show. Oh, it's uh, hilarious. He's, he's a great sense of humor. Yeah. yeah, he's very funny. Yeah. But yeah, he did adore Carrie. Carrie adored him. She was very nice to, to both of us. And, uh, you know, that, that was a tough loss. So I, I just think that we should pr promote the entire family. 
<laughs> you know, while we've got right, our well, captive I'm audience. Grateful. Yeah. I'm grateful, not only on a, on a personal note, but I'm so grateful for, for our independent bookstores in general, everyone listening, if you have the ability to support your local independent store, particularly a great good place for books, uh, do that, whether it's purchasing, you know, a book. Uh, I know, are, are you open for, for pickups? Or are, you, are you shipping? We're you, shipping. You're shipping, which is good. And I know it's so easy to, to click on some other nameless site. I'm not even going to talk about it, but uh, your money does so much more good to your community if you purchase through your local independent bookstore. Um, you may not get it the next day, but it's better for the earth if you don't have everything shipped within 12 hours. Uh, so order a couple books. You'll be glad when they arrive. Uh, but so grateful for you. And I can't wait to have our bookstores open again because uh, they're you know they're they're such an important anchor for our communities well Stephen, you know i love you and thank you for for joining us tonight sam thank you this was such, mike, a, such a pleasure Stephen. really lovely to meet you thank you so much yay and mike well i love you too you. i'm so grateful for all the support you've shown me and our family and i can't wait to hug you in person soon oh either can i okay and Give everybody Byron a big hug Get the editor and read it. It's delightful. And Lily. Yay. And, and Lily. maybe I'll pop in and check on your chat in a few weeks. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, right. everybody. Thank you.